Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Simone de Beauvoir begins section two of The Ethics of Ambiguity by talking about childhood and adolescence and the condition of people who are kept within what she calls the infantile world. And she begins with a, a reference to Descartes, man's unhappiness is due to his having first been a child. And then she says, indeed, the unfortunate choices which most men make can only be explained by the fact that they have been, taken place on the basis of childhood. And there's sort of a, a double meaning to this, given what she's saying. Part of it is, is that we, whether we realize it or not, we have imposed upon us or we willy-nilly commit ourselves to things in childhood that, that we should probably reconsider. But the other is that people continue to act in relation to the world in the way that, that children do as adults. And that's not particularly helpful as well. She talks about the child as living in a serious world. And indeed, very soon afterwards, she will talk about the serious person as engaging in something that that's, uh, has a similar attitude. What does this mean to live in a serious world? She tells us that the child's situation is characterized by finding oneself cast into a universe they have not helped to establish, which has been fashioned without them, which appears as an absolute to which he can only submit. In his eyes, human inventions, words, customs, values are given facts as inevitable as the sky and the trees. This means the world in which he lives is a serious world since the characteristic of the spirit of seriousness is to consider values as ready-made things. And so, you know, this is the, the human condition. We are all born as children into to families, into cultures, into dynamics, into situations that we did not choose. And, and many children do, in fact, experience this as unfreedom. Why do I have to go to school today? I'll give you another prime example of this. My uh, One of my daughters said, um, why do we have to take all these standardized tests? You know, they're really a waste of, of time. And well, that's the product of choices of people in the, that particular state who thought that standardized tests are really something important worth spending, you know, scarce curriculum hours upon. And so, the, you know, this is, we could talk about example after example after example. Why do we have to rise at this time? Why do we have to go to school on these days? Why is it pizza in the cafeteria today? You know, uh, we can go further and further and further. That doesn't mean that the child's world is one that is totally lacking in freedom, but they are taking the things that are there as if they are ready-made, as if they are just facts of life, as we say. Now, I do have to point out before we jump into the next discussion that de Beauvoir is not talking about every case of every child in the world. You know, when we look at cases of children who are put to labor very young or who suffered horrific abuse, I think that a lot of what she's saying here probably doesn't apply as, as well as it does to uh, other, you know, types of childhood. But it, it does cover an awful lot. So she goes on and she says, it doesn't mean that the child, him or herself, is serious. On the contrary, they're allowed to play. What does that mean? To expend their existence freely. Kids get away with, you know, spending lots and lots of time doing things that, you know, have no practical purpose 
whatsoever. I, as a child, I remember being assigned chores, getting the chores done, then going out to play, and it might be games with other people. It might be imagining ourselves as in, you know, uh, knights of old and, and getting sticks and going after each other and going on adventures. It could be pretending that we were in uh, the show Battlestar Galactica, and, you know, we used our imagination so much that we dug trenches in the ground, and that was sitting in the Viper, and then we'd load up, you know, torpedoes as, as just logs that people had cut. Well, it was silly stuff, right? Um, spending hours and hours and hours in coloring things. So children get to do that, and they passionately set up and pursue goals. You know, prime example for, for myself again was we would go to new construction sites and take the, the uh, various pallets and we would build forts out in the woods and we would spend all this time discussing should this wall go this way or this way and what about, you know, should we build another uh, story on it? Just stuff where an adult would come along and be like, what, what, what's the point of all this? And we, we thought there was a point. So as human beings, we're always engaged in some sort of goal setting and the, the child gets to do that for himself. And, and as she says, if the child fulfills this experience in all tranquility, it's precisely because the domain open to their subjectivity seems insignificant and puerile. They feel themselves happily irresponsible. The real world is that of adults where they're allowed only to respect and obey. And we could also say, there, what about children who contest that? They're still contesting it within that, that framework. Right, So there's another key aspect of this, a moral aspect. She says that um, the child takes you know, parents, teachers, others as divinities which they vainly try to be and whose appearance they would like to borrow before their eyes. Rewards, punishments, prizes, words of praise or blame instill in them the conviction that there exists a good and an evil which like a sun and a moon exist in ends in themselves. So one can be a good boy or a bad boy, right? And it's measured by this good and evil that exist out there. They're not just human created values or human oriented values. They are things that humans discover and then tell you about. And, you know, you find out how to be a good boy or good girl through all of these promptings. And like she goes on to say, normally the child escapes the anguish of freedom. They can, if they like, be recalcitrant, lazy. Their whims and concerns concern only them. They do not weigh on the earth. They cannot make a dent in the serene order of a world which existed before them. <clears throat> so then she goes on to discuss adults, adults who live within an infantile world. And here we're looking at something that is, is you know, we could say it is normal in the sense that it's been widespread, but it's not a normal part of human development in that it doesn't have to be that way. So she says, there are beings whose life slips by in an infantile world because having been kept in a state of servitude and ignorance, they have no means of breaking the ceiling stretched over their head. And she gives a number of examples that we'll look at in just a moment. She says, like the child, they can exercise their freedom, but only within this universe, which has been set up before them without them. A little bit later on, she talks about um, people who uh, have no instruments, whether it be in thought or by astonishment or anger, which would permit them to attack the civilization that oppresses them. And she says, in this case, we have to judge them only within this given situation. And, you know, it's, it's possible in this situation, limited like every other one, they realize an assertion of their freedom, but they don't have a, a possibility of liberation. So they can't actually, uh, they, they don't have the access to human freedom that, that others do. So servitude, ignorance, submission, um, these are things representing a world that is imposed upon them by other individuals, but also by social structures. So what are some examples of this? She talks about, um, you know, a little bit later on, 
the slave of the 18th century, the African slave, uh, the uh, Islamic woman enclosed in a harem, not every single woman, but those who are, you know, put into a leader's harem where they, that's it for them, that they, that has become their world. She talks about um, southern planters considering that the Africans who docilely submitted to their paternalism were grown-up children. Uh, she says, to the extent that they respected the world of the whites, the situation of the black slaves was exactly an infantile situation. They were not allowed to progress. They were kept in an infantile situation. And if they didn't, then they were, they were you know, brutalized until they would uh, go along with it. Um, she talks about the situation of women in many civilizations. They can only submit to the laws, the gods, the customs and truths created by the males. And then she says, now she's writing this, you know, in her time, even today in Western countries among women who have not had in their work an apprenticeship of freedom, there are still many who take shelter in the shadow of men. They adopt without discussion the opinions and values recognized by their husband or their lover that allows them to develop childish qualities forbidden to adults because they're based on a feeling of irresponsibility. So this is the case for, for many people. She goes on to say that in some, some cases, you know, this is actually something that a person is responsible for. So you could think of, you know, the woman who decides that, you know, she's going to be a kept person and just go along with all the opinions of her lover to keep the peace. In a way, she's choosing that. And, and she talks about choosing or consenting. She also talks about, um, complicity. Complicity with that very, power and thought structure. She, she says that, um, here we go. Uh, in many cases, this thoughtlessness, this gaiety, these charming inventions imply a deep complicity with the world of men, which they seem so graciously to be contesting. It is a mistake to be astonished once the structure seems to be in danger to see sensitive, ingenious, and light-minded women show themselves harder, more bitter, and even more furious or cruel than their masters. And she says, it's then we discover the difference which distinguishes them from an actual child. The child situation is imposed on them. The person who is consenting is in a certain way going along with it because they're deriving some sort of benefit from it. And, you know, we could say something similar, uh, similar critique arises within Mary Wollstonecraft's Vindication of the Rights of Women in her discussions of this. Now, she's also got this discussion about adolescence. And she's not saying that adolescence is normally the phase in which all this happens. Notice that she says it's rare for the infantile world to maintain itself beyond adolescence. For some children, it could be before adolescence that they're like, this isn't real. This is not the way things have to be. That happens for some very young, four, five, six years old. For many, they go beyond at, you know, that point and into adolescence. And in adolescence, they're confronted with a lot of different changes. Some of them will still, you know, decide they want to exist in the world of childhood, but they are at that point choosing it. So she says, from childhood on, flaws begin to be revealed in this world. With astonishment, revolt, and disrespect, the, the child little by little asks themselves, why must I act that way? What good is it? And what will happen if I ask, if I act in another way? She says that in this time, they are discovering their own subjectivity, and they're also discovering the subjectivity of others. They're discovering that the adults don't actually know as much as they thought that they did. And they're discovering that the stereotypes that they rely upon often turn out to be false as well. So like she says, language, customs, ethics, values, they have sources in these contingent creatures. What are the contingent creatures? The current existing adults, the adults who came before when these adults were merely children. And they realize that, you know, um, Things are not as natural, as grounded, as necessary as they've been made out to be or as they thought that they were, as they bought into. She says the moment has come when they're going to be called upon to participate in their operation of these things. His acts weigh upon the earth as much as other people. He will have to choose and decide. So she tells us that there's, there's two sides to this. Um, Adolescence is, uh, she, she goes on, a um, 
the collapsing of the serious world is a deliverance. Although he was irresponsible, the child felt himself defenseless before obscure powers. Whatever the joy of this liberation may be, it's not without great confusion, right? So adolescence is a time, she goes on to say, of moral choice. It is the moment of moral choice. Freedom is revealed. He must decide upon his attitude in the face of it. And so, you know, moral choice, like she says, moral choice is free and therefore unforeseeable. The child does not contain the man he will become, but it's always on the basis of what he has been that a person decides upon what they want to be. There's also this realization of responsibility, which could be rejected, which could be suppressed. But, you know, you're going to identify typical uh, existentialist themes here. There is a conditionment of abandonment, being stuck in a world where now there, there really is no longer anything that you can take refuge in as a safe haven when it comes to values. Uh, being unjustified, having to come up with the justifications oneself, and freedom, freedom and responsibility. There's also a, a positive side to this as well. She talks about the joy of existing, that there can be manifesting existence as, as a happiness and the world as a source of joy. But it's up to us to do that. And that does happen for many people in adolescence. That isn't an, an automatic guaranteed thing that will happen through that. So, you know, all these adults that are existing in infantile states, so long as they haven't been completely stuck within a, a power structure and meaning structure that keeps them infantilized, they will have gone through adolescence. They may be at a great disadvantage. You know, the position of women versus men, even in contemporary society, in many sectors of our society, is not exactly the same. And, and we could talk about many other uh, types of, of distinctions as well. But her point is we transition from a world of childhood in which we do have freedom, but it's not a, a freedom that, that is a freedom with responsibility to a condition in which we, as adults, do have to take responsibility. And existentialism provides us with the framework to do that. 